Hey everybody, this is Aaron Harris, host of the Football Odyssey, and today I want to talk to you about Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. And there are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone and computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So go and download the free Anchor app or go to Anchor FM to get started. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Football Odyssey. This is your host, Aaron Harris. On today's show, I'm pleased to welcome Upton Bell. Upton is a former NFL front office executive, the son of former NFL commissioner Burt Bell, a member of the sports Ray Contours, and the author of Present at the Creation, an autobiography of his life in pro football. In our conversation, Upton takes me through the course of his football journey that begins with his father's reign as the NFL commissioner, all the way through his front office experiences with the Baltimore Colts, the New England Patriots, and Charlotte Hornets of the World Football League. You can find Upton on Twitter at Upton Bell, and his book can be purchased on Amazon. I highly recommend giving his book a read, and I think you all will find Upton's recollection of his career in the days of the old NFL informative and refreshing. With that being said, thank you all for listening, and now enjoy the show. Do you have the earliest recollection of you of your introduction to football? I do, and it, you know it's funny because somebody told me the other day. They said, "You know, you realize when you die, uh, the history goes with it. There's nobody else around alive." So I said, "That's one reason to try to live to be a hundred yeah. uh, to do it." You know, yeah, I do because I talked a little bit about it in my book, and that is uh, people might find it hard to believe today, but basically. My, my recollections were living in the same house with 33 football players and the starting offensive center, Bo Lipsky, his name was, uh, got an extra five dollars a week to babysit, uh, the bell boys. And so, you know, it, it, it was almost like living in a door, except my father had rented a place on the main line. I mean, he, he and his family came out from mainline society, but his father early on told him, Hey, if you get involved in pro football, don't come to me for money. And uh, luckily for him, uh, he met and met Harry by Mother Frances Upton, who was one of the biggest stars on Broadway at the time. She lent him the money to buy the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets out of bank. And they renamed it the Philadelphia Eagles. And I don't know how much of her money uh, or his was left. But that's what happened. We lived in rented houses. Well, we first lived in a hotel, which was great for me. I loved it. Yeah. You know, we, we, we lived in, at his father owned the Rich Colton in Philadelphia, which was the biggest property in Philadelphia, which is where the first NFL draft actually was held. So I, I essentially lived in, in a hotel, then in a series of houses, and always lived football players. So to me, it was, no big deal. And but before we go deeper into your father, uh, your grandfather was actually involved in the formation of the NCAA, wasn't he? John C. Bell. I mean, that if, if if you go to my collection, by the way, which you can get at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, it, it covers the whole history from like 1885 to today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the interesting thing is my grandfather, John C. Bell, Senior actually was the founder of the modern NCAA and was second in in, in command of seniority on the on Walter Camp Rules Committee, which was the governing body then. I mean, there was God, Walter Camp, and the rest was, you know, yeah. But actually, 
uh, my grandfather actually played in a stocking cap in 1885. Wow. And when I tell you how brutal the game was then, and I've got pictures even of when Bert Bell played, and there's even old newsreels. I mean, basically, it, it, it might as well have been a clash in the 16th century. Yeah. Between two countries. And uh, f- from that, uh, he graduated on to you know, becoming a trustee at the University of Pennsylvania, so on and so forth. But the other thing is that during the early 1900s, when there were deaths in college football, it was John C. Bell, second in seniority, that was also part was camp of dealing with Teddy Roosevelt to basically save the game of college football. They had not stepped in and changed the rules, which eventually became the forward pass. Mm-hmm. Other things, goodbye football. But the other part of it's really interesting that I only learned in the last couple of years. Very famous writer who's doing uh, a, a six volumes on the life of Lincoln and a friend of mine, Sidney Blumenthal who you might talk to at some time. Uh, I basically worked in the Clinton White House. I knew him here from Cambridge. Mm-hmm. He went and found uh, the history, and there's great history on both sides. My father's father, John C. Bell Sr., Walter Camp Rules Committee, married uh, Leonard Myers' daughter. And as it turns out, Leonard Myers was one of Lincoln's closest friends. Uh, Sidney Blumenthal found correspondence and between my great grandfather, his daughter, and him, and Abraham Lincoln. Wow. And uh, so the Bell family goes all the way back to Lincoln. There are letters and there are pictures that are in my collection of UMass Amherst. So that, that on that side is really amazing. All the people on my mother's side. It goes all the way back because she lent him the money. Yeah. It goes all the way back to uh, one of the great Irish revolutionaries. Her, wow. Her, her father was chief of detectives in New York City. His name was Frank Upton. Mm-hmm. And basically, he spoke six languages and never finished high school. His, his, his father, William Cleary Upton, remember this name, actually was thrown out of Ireland uh, for basically two things. One, he wrote a book called Uncle Pat's Cabin, which told the story of how the British treated the Irish tenant farmers. It is still on Amazon today. You can get it on Amazon 150 years later. He had to flee to New York, and he had 11 children, and one of them was my mother's father, who then became one of the most famous people on the New York uh, Police Department, by send, they would send him in to different parts of New York in the late 1890s mm-hmm. and the, the 1900s because he could speak all languages. So if they wanted to know about the mafia, which was called the Black Hand yeah. at that time, Frank Elton went in. They wow. They know about the German section, the French section, whatever it was of New York City. So... There's an incredible history on both sides. Well, was he just working like, was he working undercover or was he going? Undercover. Nice. Fact, my mother told me that, that both she and her mother were scared to death because he would be missing for two or three weeks. Mm-hmm. He'd be in disguise and, and luckily he was never murdered. And so he would come home after three weeks, maybe in the middle of the night, and, and they'd be scared to death because he'd still be in disguise. <laughs> you know, whether it was a beard yeah. or, or, or whatever it was. And, I mean, the genius of these people, I mean, I've interviewed people for over 40 years from every walk of life. None more interesting than, than both sides of this family. Yeah, that's definitely a, a good lineage to come from. And from from what I understand, your mother was actually the one who was really optimistic about pro football and not your father. Is that right? Well, that's right. Because, well, basically, uh, in, in his case, he was so influenced by his father. When he finished at Penn, he, 
he led Penn to the Rose Bowl in 1917. And Burt Bell, and I'm trying to find the film because there is film there somewhere. Burt Bell actually led Penn to the Rose Bowl in the days when the Ivy League was the most powerful conference. Yeah. And through the first Rose Bowl, through the first pass in Rose Bowl history. Nice. Uh, and, and basically, so when he was finished with Penn, he basically coached at Penn under John Heisman. Nice. And, and then went to Temple. And then he got in a fight at both places by a fight, not a fist fight. Disagreement. Uh -huh. a coach staff. He had actually written a book, and I wish I could find it, on a whole new way of designing offensive football. This is in the early 1920s. And, and Lyons talks about a little bit in his book on any given Sunday. But he had just one of those brilliant minds that could see things way in the future, which was great for him later on. But basically, uh, he met my mother. At the time, she was engaged, believe it or not, to one of the richest men in America, son, Bernard Baruch. Bernard Baruch was Roosevelt's chief financial advisor. His son was so wealthy. She was Catholic, he was Jewish. And, and, and she finally... She broke the engagement to marry Bert Bell, who at the time she didn't know was broke because his father lent him hundreds of thousands of dollars and he had lost it all in the stock market. But she broke the engagement, married him, but she told him, and he started to take her to college games. She said, you're wasting your time on college football. It's the pro game. It's Red Range. It's the former pass. It's George Allison. It's the New York Giants. He said, forget that. So they started to go to games together. The next thing you know, they got secretly engaged. And the story was broken by one of the most famous gossips of people in America, Walter Winchell. Nobody knew that they had become secretly married. And finally, when it was revealed, they walked down the city hall, bought the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets with her money. I think it was $3,200. Walked back, and on their way back, they saw a big National Recovery Act sign, the Eagle, from Roosevelt, and he said, that's the name of the team. And that's how the Eagles became the Eagles. Good source of inspiration. Wow. Didn't, uh, wasn't Walter Winchell the inspiration for Burt Lancaster, uh, Burt Lancaster's character in Sweet Smell of Success? Yes. Yeah, okay, that name did sound familiar. Yeah. They knew every, they, 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 nobody knew that they were secretly married. Nobody. Somehow, Winchell was the most powerful person of his time in America, around the world. In fact, he used to lead off like this. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. North and South America and all the ships at sea. This is Walter Winchell. Then you hear the other teletype going, I'm reporting today, Francis Upton secretly married to <laughs> Kurt Bell. Blah, 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 blah. We're laughing like him. Wow. That's funny. Yeah, he definitely seems like he was a guy that was ahead of his time. <laughs> Did your father ever put into words like what it was about football that he loved? Um, like what was it about the game that just drove him to it that made him really want to dedicate his life to it? The interesting thing, and, and why I have such great memory of everything, is that that he there were three, four telephones in our house. This is going back in the forties. And he believed in doing all of his work. Now, I mean, he had an office and everything else like that. But he was always on the phone. And uh, whether it was in the middle of dinner, whether it was me getting him up at 3 o'clock in the morning, that's what I think, by the way, killed him. He, he used to say to me, if you get a call from the West Coast, pick it up and get me up. And I, I remember many times the Associated Press would be calling. In those days, they wanted answers quickly because it, it wasn't out on Twitter or out on Facebook. Or right. Out on the internet. They had de deadlines. So in L.A., the deadline's like three hours earlier. So basically, I could give you an oral history of the NFL just based on all the phone calls. So, so I would hear all the different things that, that he talked about all the important things. But basically, he was 
No person uh, that would say, this is what I love about football. You know, it's like anything else. You can pretty much tell when two people are in love, of course, until they get divorced. <laughs> right. Um, and and um, nobody would you, would, you would really have to love something to live the life that he really lived those last 13 years as commission. I mean, uh, he, he worked at it seven days a week. He worked at it all night, all day. Never once said, oh, God, this is a pain in the neck. Never once said, I hate the job. Uh, no matter what it was, he just, he, you, to me, it's not when somebody says to you, I love you, that I ever believe. It's the way they look, the way they treat you. Uh, you could tell, I mean, everybody who ever met him, even on his death, all the stories written around the country about him, where people talked about his love of the game. Still today, when you read these stories about him. So, answer you, uh, I never heard him say, boy, I love the game, but I knew what love was. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, yeah, to give to give so much of your life to a game, you definitely had to have a certain attachment to it, and but all accounts, he definitely did. And yeah, well, let me, let, me, let me give you one example of, of I mean, basically, uh, there are books written about it. I would recommend another book to you. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the guy because he's in a big book collection that I'm going to unveil later this fall. Uh, two books have been written. One, basically, on uh, the famous, during the Second World War, the merger of the Spiegels, uh, the, the merger of the Spiegels, which was the Eagles and the Steelers. And then the second year, it was the Pitt Cardinals. Yeah. Uh, by that time, my father had sold uh, his uh, his major share in the Eagles, and he and uh, Art Rooney became equal partners in the Steelers. And basically, uh, during that time period in the Second World War, first of all, my father had a league meeting. He, many times he saved the NFL. But this, this one was really interesting. They're in Pittsburgh, and the grocer who's feeding the team calls my father and said, I'm cutting off the food. Either you pay your grocery bill or, or no more food. No more meals for your players. Nothing. So they actually, this is out there, they, the Steelers actually traded a player to the Eagles in return, not for another player, but for cash. And the cash that they got paid the food bill. Now, <laughs> I mean, that's such an appropriate. That's such an appropriate story for the Steelers back then. Yeah, well, the Eagles too. I mean, the Eagles. I mean, was, uh, both both those teams uh, do it. But the story of of uh, is a major book. It's called the Steagles, and I, whatever it is, I'll find the author because I spoke to him. His wife is a diplomat. He's a big shot. He's with uh, Harry Truman. But he said just an amazing story how Bert Bell was able to engineer this. Now, the other thing is, there was a league meeting during the Second World War. Uh -huh. And uh, the league, most of the owners wanted to shut down. You know, <clears throat> we can't pay our bills, you know, this and that. And he got up and he warned them. He said, I want to tell you something. If you close this league, you will never reopen it again. I'm warning you, Right now, don't do it. The old All American Conference, which he later uh, affected the merger, mm -hmm. he, they're going to start up next year, and then they will replace us, and we will be a forgotten entity. And by one vote, they passed his motion to keep the leg open. He he was he still the owner of the Eagles at the time, or was he the uh, he wasn't he commissioner? Was the, no, no, he was now the co-owner of the Steagle Steagle, 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 Okay. He, he the Steelers, yeah, but but he didn't become commissioner in 1946. This was like 1943, 1944, right in the middle of the war. Yeah, well, that's that's good that he recommended that because there were some other. I mean, they weren't as big as the NFL, but there were some other minor league football organizations that actually went out of business because they halted operations in that time. Well, the the other thing that, that uh, I you know it's a fact from the founding of the NFL. 
uh, and it wasn't originally named the NFL, but from the founding of it back in the 20s to 1946, 20 plus teams went out of business. Mm. Yeah. And, yeah, no, and I, and I was in a league. I owned a team in a league that went out of business after a year and a half. So I, I, I know what it's like, but, but basically, uh, the, the, the whole survival thing, he really understood that and told told the owners that you if you do that, you'll never reopen again. And he got them to go that way. If not, we would, again, just like his proposal for the draft, you would not be talking to me about the NFL today. You would be talking about the old All-American Conference with Paul Brown as the chief architect. So how did he become the commissioner? It was uh, Elmer Layden before him, right? It was, I, I think, and, and this is this is really the irony. Somebody had called me a couple of weeks ago to do something on him. Is that, that basically some of the owners thought, this guy can't make any money. He had to sell his team he founded. He's co-owners with, with Art Rooney. His, pay, his teams never win anything. By the way, he still, I think, has the record of, as the losingest coach in NFL history. You're yeah, really? <laughs> I think you can look at yes. I think he did because his teams never had any money. They never had, you know, nothing. <laughs> but he was the coach. He was the coach, general manager, ticket taker, and PR director. Well, it's one man yeah. show. Yeah. But, but what they saw. And the difference between them and, and, and the owners of today, there's a lot of big differences. Some people thought he was even a clown. Oh, you know, this guy went the draft. That's great. He did because he needed to save himself in the lower teams. True. But, but the other thing was, is enough of the owners. And the most powerful guy then was really the two real powerful people. The Barrows of New York, Tim Barrow, but really George Harris. There's a reason they call him Papa Bear, Mr. Football. Mm -hmm. If you got it by Alice, you got it by. And so they looked and they said, what do we need for the future? We need somebody in some ways that has suffered through all of this, knows our problems as one of us. His name wasn't really one of them. They had a name. That's, that's what they did, which was stupid. And, but they said, Let's, let's make it unanimous. Let's make Burt Bell. This one will start them off on a, like a one or two year contract. It's the greatest decision they ever made. Because basically, what you see, and if you go down, the, the Canton Hall of Fame picked the 11 most important moments in NFL history over 100 years. Burt Bell is in practically every one of them. From the draft to sudden death, to the extra, but you, you name it, he's in the middle of it. I, what they saw, I think, is let's take a chance on a guy who knows us. Mm -hmm. He knows our problems. And, and it's really amazing because all, I think the reason he, in my opinion, was the greatest commissioner sports ever had, no, no commissioner ever suffered like that. And he used all of those lessons to, to carry the league through the most dangerous period, from 46 to 59. What would you say was his greatest contribution to the league? Well, I'd have to say the, the, the draft. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Uh, I mean, that, 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 well, I'd say two, but there are many more. The draft and sudden death. Mm -hmm. The draft saved the league, sudden death put it on the front pages around America, and, and eventually drove it to be the number one sport that it is today. And, and both of them, one for survival. I know when he got up with the league meetings in 1935 and said, gentlemen, uh, we're only as strong as our weakest link, and I have one of the weakest links, and we need to do this and convince them to do that. The second time was, and it's really, again, uh, a funny story. At one of the league meetings, he said, you know what? In those days, the Chicago All-Star game was the biggest game in the country, the pros versus the colleges. <laughs> a lot of people don't realize up to the like the middle, late 50s, 
the colleges won a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people said these pros for Christ's sake, they're not very good. I went to five all star games, and I can tell you this. It's hard to tell people this today. It was one of the great events in America. Eighty to a hundred thousand people, soldiers field. You know, no television. People dressed like they would go to the opera today. I mean, it was an event. And uh, one of the other little known facts about this, and I know I'm jumping around, is uh, do you know that that uh, at, at one time, because the NFL, oh, well, nobody knows really, and I couldn't give you the answer either, why there were black players in the NFL, African Americans, for a while then, why there weren't. But the Chicago All Stars played the champions, I think it was the Bears or the Rams. And, and they had to get uh, a, a written permission because the All-Stars had black players the NFL did not. And, and Jackie Robinson, by the way, was one of the great players in the Chicago All-Star game. I, I, I've seen a lot of films on Robinson and Woody Strode and, and uh, Kenny Washington. Mm-hmm. It's one of the greatest black people you've ever seen. Put the film on and look at it. That was a uh, UCLA, right? UCLA. Uh, but the thing was, back to why we ended up with this whole situation of sudden death. So he said in the late meetings, what are we going to do if a championship game ends up with a tie? Somebody said, flip a coin. He said, you got to be kidding. He said, you know how ridiculous we'll look in this country? We're trying to fight for a survival to begin with. <laughs> we've got, we've now got the All Star Game, which the Chicago Tribune and Arch Ward, who was the single most powerful sports person in the country, he invented the All Star Game in baseball, which they still play today, and and the and the NFL game, and gave the NFL a chance to be front and center with all the people that you had to sell from college into the pros. So he said, we're going to look ridiculous. So somebody said, well, what, what, what should we do? And he said, here's what we need to do. If it ends up in a tie, uh, at the end of the game, we come out the center of the field, we flip the coin, and we play another 15-minute session till somebody scores. Unlike today. Till somebody scores. That's like the true sudden death mm-hmm. is half death. But uh, basically, those two things are the keystone for the NFL even existing. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely had its impact whenever 1958 came around with the Colts and the Giants, definitely, and the draft. I was there. You were there? I was there, and I can tell you this. Even though today you look at it, ESPN did it on the 50th anniversary, the players look slower in a screening film and everything else like that. That was a different way when they shot things in those days. I can tell you, the game was, well, the players weren't quite as fast because today they can, they can run the 40 and 4 1 4 2. Mm-hmm. The game was fast. It was dramatic. It should have been a runaway by the Colts. The Giants catch it, but they're still the greatest drive to me in history. When it was still kind of a virgin game, was United's drive for the for the field goals, tie it, and then after. And the interesting thing about that too is there were New York Giants players. United knew, the Colts knew, Burt Bell knew, Upton Bell knew, but there were Giants that went out for the flip and they're saying, "What the hell's going on here? We thought the game would end up with a tie." They didn't know the rules. Wow. You actually, there's actually still players uh, today, I think, or I don't know how recently it's been. It's probably been a few years, but whenever they, in the rare instance when they end the game in a tie after playing overtime, they thought they kept playing, but they, they didn't even know the rules for that. And today, where, you know, if you end in a tie after a whole other period, that's it. <laughs> I, I, no, it, it, it is really amazing. And maybe it's the intensity of the game. The people actually, the, the, Aaron, the feeling of people in the stands, I, I can't tell you, and, and I'm glad I sat in the stands 
I mean, it was right on the 50-yard line, the upper deck at Bank Stadium. And, and remember, there was a newspaper strike during that period. Okay. And, and um, I sat outside instead of sitting in the press box, but all, all of Bert Bell's children were there. And he was there, and he had a, a thing that was a ritual that he, he and Art Rooney, his former partner, always went and sat together at the championship game. So he, instead of sitting in the press box, sat outside of it in the stands. But the buzz in the stands is something I will never forget. Uh, as, as you know, then I was just plain one years old. And that feeling has never left me because it was kind of semi-confusion, a lot of buzzing by people, you know, people saying, he said, well, now, now what happens? And, and then, and then the whole drama of it, uh, including still to this day, now I have binoculars and the two key plays in the game. And one was United never would have gotten the chance in the last two minutes to drive them for the tying field goal. Uh, it, it, it was third down and the handoff was to give Frank Giffen. And, uh, it appeared to me, the different made the first step, which he had the game over. And it's still to this day one of the most controversial calls on the, they've tried everything on it and they say that he didn't make it. I swear he did. And there are people arguing in the stands about it. And again, in overtime, the Giants got the ball first. And again, it was like third and one or whatever else. Uh, uh, yes, it was third and one. And again, it was almost as close a call. The big ifs on those two plays, and it could have gone the Giants' way, but that's what made it so great, the big if. I think, you know, it's a, I think it's magical, too, especially looking back now for you, that whatever the call on the field was made, that was it. You know, there wasn't a five or ten minute replay. There wasn't two weeks of conversation after it. It was just kind of those moments that can make or break a game. But if you were there, you you could only really understand it if you were actually there. Well, yeah, and and, and, and I am not somebody who lives in the past at all, like today's game or anything else. Like but they have made it into something that it shouldn't be. It's almost like they need orgasm on every play. Yeah, let's, let's have. Let's have the replay on everything. Let's expect the guy's job. I'm saying to myself, Jesus, let him play. <laughs> One of the great things, Aaron, that I will tell you before instant replay, and I have no problem with instant replay, is when you have a crucial play, there were people for years, still to this day, if any of them are alive, that will argue on that third and one with the Giants. Great plays, because they weren't re-shown, really only on film you could see them, you know, a couple of days later. Great plays were discussed for weeks. The newspaper headlines, did he make it? Uh, all, of the, all of the things that made it water cooler, as they call it, conversation, gone now. I mean, you know everything. You can hear the calls of the defense. You can you can hear the, the quarterback checking off. If if the coaches like Bill Belichick had their way, there would be replay on every play. Yeah, and it's taken away from the game. What made football, and I'm not here to to uh, treat, but what made football so good was because it's got the most amount of players. There are 22 players at the snap of the ball. Uh, one missed block, one missed tackle, and, and, and it's a big play. But what has happened to it is, is we know everything. You never knew. For instance, one of the great speeches before a championship game was the 58 championship game, and we, Viewbank, who was not known to give speeches, who was kind of dry, a brilliant little guy, went in the locker room before the game, and he started out and he said, gentlemen, today, we're all going to find out, I'm paraphrasing how good we are. And then he turned to his player and said, Gino Marchetti, you're a free agent. Nobody wanted you. Art Donovan, you were dumped by Cleveland. Nobody wanted you. John Unitas, 
you're off the sand watch. Who the hell wanted you? He won a Raymond Berry. You were, you were taken in the 23rd round. Nobody cared about you. He went through the whole lineup, which which was true about most of the Colts were off cast. And he said, today we're going to find out if all these stories are true or not. People still talk about that on the inside. Today, CBS, NBC, ABC, Fox, uh, now Amazon, you name them, every one of these people, they'd be in the locker room. The same way with, with, with the owners. The, the, the owners at one time were seen and not heard and they wanted it that way. Now today, you can't have a locker room without Bob Kraft or somebody else uh, down there, uh, uh, you know, swarming around the players and I'm saying, God, everybody wants a piece of showbiz. Yeah, it's certainly performative, definitely. And I think, too, it's uh, what you said about the players and Baltimore being cast off actually kind of makes a lot of sense for how they gelled so well with the city. I definitely want to talk a lot about your career in Baltimore, but that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense how Baltimore has this sort of inferiority complex to a lot of other metropolitan areas in the North. And so many of the players were cast off from like the Browns or from like other great franchises. And they put together, you know, sort of a team that I think has. Well, you know, not, not only that, if you remember the original cities and some of the cities taken in with, with the merchant. Yo, know, you had Green Bay. Who the hell would go to Green Bay? Right. <laughs> and, and yet, they, you know, think about that. Cecil Isabel and, and, uh, many of the, Don Hudson. You ever put on a film with Don Hudson? Now they can say it's a bunch of white guys playing against each other and look at them here and look at me. Put on a film occasionally. Look at Sammy Ball. Look at, look at all of these players that, they say today, maybe like Olive, Olive Graham was one of the greatest athletes I've ever seen. Anyhow, terrific basketball player. And the ball was huge back then. Yeah, the, the, the ball was, to throw that ball, I one day was at the the uh, uh, Redskins training camp. Mm -hmm. then, then called the Redskins. And and they had a drill, and there was a, you know, the, the football, the tire football. Swinging back and well, I saw Sammy Ball throw the ball like 40, 50 yards straight over the line, right through the football. He had as strong an arm as anybody I've ever seen. Uh, you talk about Dan Marino, you talk about Elway, you talk about some of the great arms. Sammy Ball's sidearm, his accuracy was incredible. But you know, again, it was a different time, so people tend to say, oh, you know, those guys were good, but. Not that good. They're wrong. Well, he was a he was really a pioneer in the passing game too, because even when he was at college, he played for Dutch Meyer at TCU, who was like one of the premier right. passing uh, pioneers in the late forties. Actually, even before then, he going into the nineteen thirties. I mean, he he wrote like a book about the spread offense. I think in nineteen fifty. Well, I did not, not only that. Remember, he played two ways in those days. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's also one of the better safeties. That in the lake, and maybe maybe one of the best punters I've ever seen. Wow. Kicking a football, as you explained, see, this is hard, and why now I pay no attention to the records. The records for me were now 17 games. We went from 12 games to 14 games to 16 games, now to 17 games, and the 17 games, all, all this is another payday for the owners. I understand that. Uh, but basically, when records were set, they really meant something. Yeah. Instance, John Unitas' record to me is the closest thing to Lou Gehrig's. In that John Unitas, in a 12 and then 14 game schedule, threw a touchdown pass in every game for better than three years. Think that's when the quarterback was getting killed. Yeah. You don't need to protect the quarterback. I mean, today you can't even touch it without the flag going up. I mean, I, I was on the sidelines for the early part of his career, and I can tell you this. I've never seen anybody take a beating. He was totally crippled at the end of his life. But he was such a good passer and such precision, such ability to look off the defense. The inventor of the two-minute 
offense. It's a quick out pass. A quick out pass of 20 yards, not five like you get now. And basically, you say to yourself, consider what those people did in a time when, as you point out even earlier, and the football was bigger, the game was brutal, and, and yet they set all sorts of records. So I don't discount what they did. Well, and even too, you know, United's didn't play in an offense that had three wide receivers. You know, it was always two split backs, the tight end, and two receivers. You know, it's you're talking about setting records in a pretty primitive offense by today's standards. Well, then, yeah, and, and, and of course, not only setting records, but he was one of the first two to be the two, which they all do today. Ad nausea is to dump the ball off to his backs in case, in that case, Tom Matty, people like that. Mm. Your father also came up with the um, establishing former FBI agents in every NFL city, right? He did, and that, and that again was should be one of the things that saved pro football because the day of the championship or the night before the championship game, he got a call from uh, Frank Hogan, the district attorney in New York. And he said, Mr. Bell, you better come up here now. Usually, in those days, you take the train and come up the day of the game. But he went up the day before. And they met all night with, with uh, the Giants. I don't know whether uh, Hallis was there or not, but mainly with detectives and with the district attorney in New York. And you can imagine, this is 1946, only months into when he was named commissioner. And, and if that had gone wrong, it, that would have been the end of the NFL. So he, he, they, what they told him was that there was a gambler by the name of Alvin Paris, who basically uh, had talked to players and asked, asked certain players, two, two of them, Merrill Hates and Frank Filchuk. Filchuk was the star of the team, the quarterback for the Giants, and Hates was the running back and basically uh, wanted them to you know, shave some points. And basically, they, they never did, but they didn't report the bribe, uh, which is just as bad. Right. When pro football is trying to protect themselves. So basically, they met all night long. They called the hates and Phil Chuck in. And my father on the spot did something that he had to do. He let Phil Chuck play. He said, you know, I can't take the quarterback out, but he suspended hates uh, for life, essentially, and then basically made an announcement to the media. You know, my father said, which most politicians don't do as we see today, get the truth out, don't lie, tell them exactly what happened, and he was front page news all over the country, and basically said, this is the situation, this is the uh, action that I have taken, the game will be played tomorrow. And uh, actually, as it turned out, Filchuk played pretty well, uh, even though he threw, I think, three or four interceptions. But the suspicion of the fix was not in the public's mind because Kurt Keller stepped in. So what he did immediately after that, his quarterback, uh, Davey O'Brien, who was the first player ever to be insured by Burt Bell for $100,000 of points of London against injury. And he was a great little quarterback out of, out of TCU, too. And basically, uh, he, he's one of the best players of his time, even though he's only 5'5", five 5'6". Five, five, he, he retired early in his career and went to work for the FBI. And when J. Edgar Hoover became one of the best pistol shots in America. So my father calls him. And he will come on later on in this conversation as a friend of Lamar Hunt's. And he said, uh, I need, can you talk to, to Director Hoover? I need uh, ex-FBI men. I want to put every city to follow players, to go into bars, to go everywhere, to make sure that there is no uh, offers of gambling and to make sure the game is absolutely pure. The other thing he did, and the phone was there even after the day he died, put a phone a separate phone, I'm not sure it was a different color or not, that we were never to touch. And and what he did is he made a deal because he knew from his days of gambling, he knew there were three guys who were hockey, wingy, and fist. <laughs> <laughs> he 
these guys that would call him starting on Monday and all the way up to Sunday, almost game time, with the odds on each game and whether they have fluctuated or not. So if he, if if on a Sunday he saw the Bears went from being favored by three points to be favored by six points in the past, that probably meant somebody was injured or somebody had done something. So he would immediately call a locker room and call, you know, whether it was Hallis or somebody, say, what the hell's going on there? And he might say, well, somebody called a cold. So and what he basically did also, which is still in effect today, he invented the waiver wire and the notification. 72 hours before the game, every club, which you have still today, 70, 80 years later, every club must report who was injured and why. And, and those steps that he took, the NFL now has one of the biggest apparatuses, not that they always do the best job of, of uh, investigating everything as we see. And basically, that was 1946 and 1946, 54, 75 years later, you still have the waiver wire and you still have the injury report. That was his brilliance. Did he also bring in Austin Gunsel for some of that as well? Yes. yes. He, he did. He brought him in as treasurer, but he also had him, you know, be part of this apparatus at the, at the time. But he didn't bring him in until later on. Uh, he did most of it himself. And then Gunsel became uh, acting commissioner and, and had a fair, fair shot of becoming commissioner after Burt Bell died. Uh, but then eventually on the 33rd ballot, whatever it was, it was Roselle. But Gunsel came in, but he one of, one of many parts of Burt Bell's genius was his mind and what he could keep in his head. Now, he wrote a lot of things on yellow pads and all sorts of things, but he could put his hand on get Emlet. He could put his hand on the Lake Rules. He studied the Lake Rule book and then hired his brother, John C. Bell Jr., who ended up becoming the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, was also governor and lieutenant governor, to write the, the legal part of the NFL the Constitution and bylaws. That, I believe, is still in there today. If he could put his finger on the player, the game, the gambling, the business aspect of it, of the legal aspect of it. Just one of those ones you'll never see again. Yeah, that definitely makes a great commissioner, one who has oversight of everything. And after he passed away, he passed away at an Eagles-Steelers game at Franklin Field. And obviously, obviously for you, that was a tragic day and you had just lost, you know, a man that you love very much. Um, and from reading your book, I kind of got the sense that after that happened, you were kind of uncertain of what your future would be. Was, was that fair to say? Oh, damn fair to say. <laughs> the, well, the, the biggest irony of that is not only do you lose a father, and we were all there. I was there. I'm trying to remember run across the field, which I did. I ran on the field of play and, and tried to get to him when somebody pointed out with their binoculars that it looks like Bert Bell's down in the end zone. And uh, that, that day is still shared in my mind all these years later. But the other thing is we didn't know till later in the week. We were sitting home getting ready for uh, the the funeral and basically uh, got a call from the Philadelphia National Bank and they said the deal's off. We said, what deal? They said, uh, well, Bert Bell had made a deal to buy back the Philadelphia Eagles. You ready for this? For $950,000. The papers were due to be signed Wednesday and he drops that on Sunday. If he lives to Wednesday, you're now talking to the owner of the Eagles. Not just a kid looking for a job. That's life. Why? Why did he? Why do you think he kept that to himself? Why don't you think he said anything to the there family? Was, there were certain things he did. I mean, he was very close to his family. I mean, he always had one of his children with him everywhere. He was a great family man. And basically, because he hadn't told anybody, and he didn't want it, you know, for me to slip it out to somebody that might. You get a same go to a newspaper man and say, Did you hear Bert Bell's going to retire as commissioner? He didn't want the owners to know. 
uh, at that time, because then if, if they think he's getting out, you know, who knows what happens? You know, they, there's no already maybe starting to look for somebody. It could upset everybody. He wanted to wait until the end of the season. And, and it would have been perfect for him to announce that he's retiring and he bought the Eagle. But he didn't, he didn't, and I don't think the bank wanted it out in the newspapers either at that no. time. So, so he did. But, but one of the things he took to his grave was basically he was out. He was, he was going to be the owners. And, and, and he often said at the time, I want to take care of my kids. I want to take, I, I, I want them to have something after all of the struggles. And what better to buy back the team that he gave his life to and found it? Uh, the, the other thing is, I remember private conversations that never came out. And again, it's a story of life. Is that when he made it possible for Kyle Rosenblum to buy the Colts and had to convince him to do it, and Rosenblum turned around, it was a gold mine for him. Years later, he would say to Rosenblum, just remember, Carol, I want a piece of that team for my kids. Well, of course, when you die... That word goes out. <laughs> that, that goes out. There's nothing, there was nothing in writing. But I know that because I heard the football calls. So I, I, knew, I knew that one way, at least, I heard the conversation on the Colts with Rosenberg. I, I never, my brother, uh, my mother never knew the secret Eagles team. And maybe he, maybe he figured out, well, you know what? I really, maybe I really can't do this with Rosenberg, uh, basically, but I can do this by buying my team back and, and you know, friendly bank. Think about that. It's what, worth three billion today? Why not for fifty thousand dollars? We'd be doing this interview from my box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well yeah, that's that's part of like the, the tragedy of life in, in some sense. You know, you you're so close to something and sometimes you never know it, sometimes you do know it, but you know, where wherever the, the chips fall where they may, you just kinda have to roll with it, right? Yeah, the the greatest thing uh from no that I could give to people, whatever they do, sports or not, is basically if you can't deal with adversity, you're not gonna make it through life. You just Yeah. Not, not. And and I and I've seen a lot of adversity and uh, I, I'm still very positive about life and, and about a lot of things. That's good, that's good. And you, so you you were able to have a career in the NFL, and you started with the Baltimore Colts um, under Rosenblum. And you, you started off as I guess as a runner, where you were giving players their uh, meal money and their cards when they were on the away games and everything like that. Correct? Yeah, I went to the first uh, went to the training camp in, in 1960 uh, uh, when it looked like they they were going to be triple champions. They were going to be three peaks. I mean, they were that good. So I went to this uh, in the summer. I, I was in my senior year of college and I went that summer. Rosenblum said to you, you know what? Uh, you need to go to training camp. And uh, basically, then after, after your college years over, you come back and work full time. So I went to training camp and basically, uh, I was the person on the road trips. You know, today they got 55,000 people doing a job that one person could do. Uh, basically, uh, when, when we were on the road, I hand out the paycheck, the keys <clears throat> to the, uh, the keys to the uh, rooms and like a traveling secretary, that type of thing. And then uh, basically <clears throat> did anything else that they needed for me to do a training camp. It also gave me the opportunity uh, to go to practice and see all the things that I need to see. Be, sit in occasionally, read you back in the coaches. I mean, I, I was a coach. You know, a, lot, a lot of people, again, don't think of Bert Bell, but Bert, you know, I, I'm the son of a quarterback and the son of a coach. Mm -hmm. I end up being the son of a commissioner, not the son of a bench. <laughs> uh, doing all those things. So <clears throat> it gave me 
the background that I needed, particularly that first summer. And, and really, I could see that there weren't injuries that, in my opinion, because in those days you played six. Think about this. These guys are bitching today that you played six preseason games and then a regular season. And so I had the chance to see all the great players, in, most of them in their prime, but also what it took through a training camp and stuff like that. And, and it, it, really, it really got me going. Did, was there anything during that first summer that, like a, a habit or a lesson that you had learned that you kind of carried with you throughout your professional career? I didn't always do it the right way, but keep your mouth shut. Learn, learn, learn what's going on. I mean, the media in those days, unlike today, I mean, here with Belichick, uh, the, the media is treated like the Kremlin treats people. <laughs> yeah. Because you, you can't get near anybody. In those days, you know, the, the average crowd for training camp might be 10,000 people. I mean, it, it was an incredible circus. And all, all of the writers, there were three full-time writers, columnists occasionally came. But they were telling the team, they live with us. They were on the planes with us. So you had to know what you kept to yourself. You had to know what you did not to ever repeat what a player says you hear in a locker room. Uh, if you went into a bar, which I really didn't do that summer. And you know, just how to be discreet. And again, even going with coaches to their meetings, keep your mouth shut. Listen. Listen and learn, and and that that was a, a great lesson. Don't Baltimore was a town that they were like your family. They were they were in love with you, and they they wanted to know everything about you. But you have to be careful; you can't tell your family too much. Yeah, that's very wise. That's very wise to learn at a young age, because it's like you said, and sometimes you may say when you may speak up when you're not supposed to speak up and then you could overhear what someone's saying that could be valuable to you. And then you're always worried about saying something to the wrong person that could come back to you. And then you're on the chopping block. Well, the, the other thing that I learned very early on, I could still to this day, like it keeps me um, hesitant at times about certain things. When my father first became commissioner, we went to all the training camps. You know, I went to the Bears training camp in 46 and, and saw all the guys coming back from the war, Ben Sid Luckman, uh, you know, McAfee, all, all the great players of that time. And and uh, basically, before we went, my father said, I'm going to tell you right now, if anybody asks you who you root for, because remember, he founded the Eagles, he owned this, both of them, the Eagles and the Steelers, but he said, if any newspaper man, in those days, newspaper men were Wanted to talk to Burt Bell's kids, too. My pictures in the L.A. Times from 1946 for, for a preseason game out there. They want to know what did Burt Bell's kids say. <clears throat> and he kind of rehearsed this. He said, why, oh, Upton, if uh, Arch Ward or somebody says to you with a Chicago Tribune, who are you rooting for? What do you say? You say, we're neutral. We don't root for anybody. We're neutral. I still today have dreams about being neutral. You know, we're Switzerland. And so it, it was very difficult. Uh, as, a, as a child, although I never thought I was a child, I kind of always thought I was kind of a grown up uh, at, at, that, at that age. Is that basically, I really found it hard, you know, whether I wanted to root for the Eagles. Like my favorite team. I don't think I ever told anybody. The team I loved the most was the Chicago Bears. Mm -hmm. Because it was the first training camp other than as a kid for the Eagles. And George Hallis, I had a chance to see things people never would see. Hallis, well, let me see, I was 1946, I, I was nine years old. But I was kind of an adult. And, and George Hallis would let me come in to his meetings at night. And, and I was able to see the famous Clark Schultz, who belongs in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. 
uh, designed the modern T formation on the blackboard. Here's Buck Bell's kids yelling, I'm sitting there, and he he doesn't pat me on the head and treat me like, like some you know, little kid. He says, hi, Uppy, come on in, sit at him. And, and I, I watched uh, Chilifee on the blackboard in those days with chalk actually take, in, in those days you had the quarterback, the fullback, the left hand back, the right hand back. You had your, your wide receivers, they called the men's there, were actually on the line of scrimmage. And he broke one player off, and that became the modern day flag. And I was there. It was, it was like Moses getting the tablets for Christ's sake. You know, it was, it was just something to see. Now, at the time, you don't, you don't realize it, but in there, too, were, were Hall of Famers. George Hallis, one of the coaches, Patty Driscoll, which was in, who was in the Hall of Fame, Hunk Anderson, and uh, Luke Johnson. I mean, they, these were legendary coaches. But, but to listen to mine, so as we're about to leave, Training camp. We're out there for a week. I was said, up he? he said he could he could see how much I loved him. And he said, Up if we win the championship, he said, I'm gonna send you a goal football. I know it's against the rules. And by God, they won the championship that year. And sitting in my collection on display for people all over America is George Howe. This is 1946 gold football from the Chicago Bears with my name on it. That's that's probably the uh, the best thing you could have gotten at as a nine year old. As any as anything, yeah. I, I've been offered thousands of dollars. For it. I mean, my Super Bowl ring is in there uh, in this collection. But but and that it's a solid gold football. I mean, some phony, you know, thing and and uh, it just. So secretly, I rooted for the Bears. Well, I, you you even mention in your book that uh, the Bears were like such a an iconic team at that time, and it was actually they had like a mythology around them too that you probably couldn't get today because if you didn't have it, if you weren't in Chicago, you really couldn't see them because if you didn't have a TV, you had to rely on the radio. So you kind of let your imagination. Uh, you know, you, you attach your imagination to the players, in a sense. Well, you know, it, it, it's, it's like, in some ways, college football, Notre Dame, the Subway alumni. I mean, every Saturday, you could get uh, Notre Dame on the radio around the country. And, and the Bears were the monsters of the Midway. I mean, they were Bronco Nagurski before them. They were the fabulous Sid Luckman. In fact, that's another person you want to get in touch with. Um, uh, there is a book called Tough Luck on the Life of Sid Luckman. Okay. And I, I did know this. What other people didn't know, they got in touch with me when the book came out. The author I talked to, I interviewed him, he's in my book collection, is that Sid Luckman's father was in prison for murder. Mm -hmm. Today, can you imagine Twitter, Facebook, can you imagine? Jimmy SPM, Jesus Christ, you know, they'd have Stephen A. Smith doing heck butt wheels over this. <laughs> so, so the, the, uh, it's a famous story, but yet Sid Luckman was the quarterback in America in the National Football League. And, and also, in succeeding camps, think about this. Sid Luckman, Johnny Lucha, who, by the way, is still alive, Bobby Lane, George Blanda. The Bears had to get rid of two Hall of Fame quarterbacks and kept Blanda for a while because he could kick because of the roster size and they didn't have room for all. So I saw all of these people come in at their height. Ed Sprinkle. You, you name it. Uh, and so I was able to, to see that and see the Bears and, and they just they, they're a different they're a different type of cat. In that basically, I try to explain a little bit in my book, but I'll, I'll, I'll develop it more for you. As, as a child that basically, you know, lived during the Second World War, and I try to tell people this today, no matter what the differences were in this country, everybody was together. My father 
who really owned the Eagles, who might have been the Steelers at that time. He was an air raid boy. Everybody pitched in. Everybody, every porch, every place in America. You know, you, you waited for the bad news. People, you know, really, really got it together for a while. Even though there were great, you know, divisions in the country and there were problems with race, great problems, there was a sense of sacrifice. There was a sense that we were all in it together. And then the war is over and they're coming back. I remember one day, one of the bears, I mean, there were scrimmages all the time. Mm -hmm. Unlike today, you know, today they, they don't want to touch each other anymore. And I understand, you know, the players, it's completely different. And they're making different money. But I remember one day seeing a player get back down, was sitting on tackling them, and he got hit pretty hard. And the, kind of the child part of me, not the adult, felt really bad. And I think he could see it. The walking off the field, he kind of put his arm around me, and he, and he said, kid, this is nothing. He said something to the effect of, this is nothing compared to killing people. Yeah. He was a vet. And those people that came back from that war, I'll always have great feeling for them. Not so much whether they are play football players or not. There was a maturity that you'll never see ever again. There, there, was, there was a feeling among those people. They, you know, pro football players, as you know, you're a researcher. They never made much money until now. Uh, but basically, you could feel like they really loved what they were doing. But they also, typically that class that came back the next few years after the end of the war is those men had seen terrible things. They had seen death. And so to them, this game wasn't that bad. When I was, this is, it was this past Easter, I was back in my parents' place. And they have a, uh, it was a book they had at all when I was growing up, uh, Tom Brokaw, The Greatest Generation. Yep. And I, I read about the first 100 pages, and I actually watched the two HBO miniseries, uh, Band of Brothers in the Pacific. And it's incredible to think about how you have ki basically people who are 17 and 18 years old having to go off and basically save the world. You know, it's it, it really was a triumph that I don't think you're ever going to replicate in preceding you, generations. Well, you, you can't. When, when, when my other, other people go into the Eagles training camp, and I'm still friendly. Uh, with his son in law's concrete chelly, Chuck yeah. Panera. Yeah. 17 years old, flying 30, 30 missions over Germany as a tail gunner. And, and uh, you know, I have such great respect for those people and, and what they did. I mean, they didn't, uh, you didn't have to draft them. They went down, I mean, my own father, think about this. If any quarterback would do this today, he had been voted the the, uh, uh, the captain of Pitt, mm -hmm. and uh, he was a junior. And they played on Thanksgiving Day, and right after the game, he and a group of Penn athletes, including John B. Kelly, Grace Kelly's father, okay, uh, who became a lifelong friend of my father's, walked down. And volunteered for the First World War. And basically, my father uh, and Kelly became great friends. And uh, during the second, the First World War, my father was cited by a general person for bravery in the field. And this, this again is show me any personality from any walk of life, any type of entertainment. Show me their young life, and I'll show you who they are now. And basically, what happened was he was part of what would be a, a mass unit today. And basically, uh, they had called in bombers to, to the Germans had called in bombers, bombers, I mean, planes at that time, to bomb even the people who were wounded. And basically, 
uh, my father was told us, we've got to clear out. We, we, we'll clear out as many people as we can, but we have to leave. And he refused to leave and he stayed behind uh, under en enemy fire to make sure that those people were protected. And he was he was also uh, cited by, by France and by Taylor Pershing for bravery in the field. He comes back the following year and basically leads Pitt into the Rose Bowl. So to me, and I never knew it. I never knew the story. He was part of a, another great generation that never talked about themselves, never talked about it. I never knew the story until somebody wrote it after he died. Never. Mm. Or saw any of the pictures of, of him in his uniform as he went. So, you know, you, you just, that doesn't say that the people today that fight and, and give their life for this country or any more or less heroic than those people. It was just, it was a time that you, your country was a big deal. Even if you disagree with people like they do today. So, so when I look at that, I, I say to myself, I'm not surprised at all that Burt Bell was maybe the greatest commissioner of all the time because before being commissioner, he was a great person because he understood the human nature. Well, speaking of human nature, I mean, you in, in your book, you have a um, a pretty lengthy section of the book where you're working as a scout for the Colts, and you have sort of like these coming of age moments, both personally and professionally. But I want to discuss personally first. We're talking about assassinations and going to the South in the sixties and your children being born. Can you, can you just kind of talk about how that experience impacted you and influenced your growth as a young adult? Well, I, I would say the best thing that ever happened to me was becoming a scout before becoming the head personnel director at the Colts is because, uh, it, and I've in fact thought about writing a second book uh, just on my experiences. I, I've been in every state in this country. Mm. including Hawaii and Alaska. And and so in those days, unlike today, although you later in my career you, you did a lot of jet travel, but you would get in a car, and I started in 1963-64, you get in a car, you leave in February, and you come back sometime the end of May, June. And you would drive from place to place. So I would start out I'd leave Baltimore, go through Virginia, the Shenandoah Valley, Tennessee, Kentucky, every one of the southern states, and then head across the border from Louisiana into Texas, all the way across Texas, Arizona, New Mexico. I mean, I, and, and I saw America at a time, if you think things are bad today, uh, and I'm talking particularly in the South, not that there aren't plenty of examples in the North of extreme prejudice, but uh, I, I did a series, and, and I'll send them to you, or have somebody send them to you, of nine episodes on, on my life and look at football. Mm -hmm. And particularly one is of the title from the book, The South is Burning. And the eye-opening thing was, I was always aware that there's prejudice. I mean, I played on the playgrounds of Philadelphia and played with many of African-American players, one being a friend of mine, you might remember the name George Raveling, uh, who was just cited by the, of the Hall of Fame for his contributions to basketball. Uh, but basically in those days, we played with a lot of African-American players, even in the 50s, even though most things were not integrated. Yeah. I remember at one time, Player saying to me, listen, man, there's only one rule here. You win, you say, you lose, and get the hell off the court. And, and that's the way race was. It was honest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I remember going into little towns that in 1963, 64, 65, all the way through to the 70s, I looked like I was like 16 years old. You know, I had a fur haircut. And I look again, I just have one of those really young faces. 
And luckily, I had uh, a, a, an identification point that I worked for the coach, where I might have been chased down in the Chattahoochee River. Because during that period, you had the Freedom Riders, you had violence all over the place. I mean, I had to be careful where I went into and, and, and what I did. Uh, but basically, I remember being stopped in a few small towns and being asked, one asked, are you a freedom rider? And I said, no. I said, I work for the coast. And I looked at me and laughed. He said, can't be. I said, no, here, officer, here's my car. If you get caught in a small town in the 60s and, and you don't, and they don't know who the hell you are, but you don't have identification, they might find you, they might not find you. And so there, there was fear on my part that there was great understanding of, of not only what race was about, but the sacrifices of people, Prairie View, Bramley, Alcorn a and Texas a and Texas A&I, Jackson State, you name them, uh, that I went to. And basically, you know, what, like some of the most beautiful places I've ever seen in the South are, are like, Driving from Jackson to Alcorn A&M, which is in northern Mississippi, you go down the Natchez Trace, which is absolutely gorgeous. Just don't go at night, because there are no lights for about 50 to 100 miles, and there could be gunshots everywhere. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's right in the middle of, of civil rights, right in the middle of marches, right in the middle of real fire. And so, I, I developed... Not only great respect for those schools, but for the players, many of whom should have been drafted much higher. But because, uh, it's a great athlete, but he's from Jackson State. Let's take him on the fifth round. Well, I know he's a first round choice. And I would go back sometimes and say, say to the coaches, whoever it was, this guy is really good. I say, I'll be getting the sixth round. I said, he's a first round choice. So they say, grow up. He's a fourth round choice. We can get him on that round. So those first hand lessons uh, that I can say to you, not somebody from afar saying football's got problems or this or that. I saw it, I lived it. Uh it, it was it was so dangerous those times. Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King. Uh, you you name it. it, it just it will never leave me. And and I I really hope for people today uh, to think about what you do and what you say before you do it. Now as a now from a professional standpoint, you were a scout right in the middle or right at the height of the talent battle between the AFL and the NFL. Did you feel like, like, how high were the stakes? I mean, did you feel like if you didn't sign or, like, sign a player that you were going to lose your job? I mean, was it really that intense of a battle, especially in the moment? Nah, I, 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 but, but I, I knew, you know, that I had to do my job. And it was, uh, the first time was 1963. Well, I was said, well, I mean, the, the battle between the two lakes was incredible. I mean, that, that, that again, because the money involved in the end was, was, was caused the merger. If it wasn't, they'd still be fighting today. But, I mean, it was real war. I mean, people were being kidnapped. People were being hit in, in hotels. I remember uh, a beast in 1963 uh, to Atlanta, Georgia, to keep uh, Billy Lothridge, who was a quarterback at Georgia Tech, and Billy Martin, who was a tight end, uh, uh, basically, and was taken number one by the Chicago Bears and Ted Davis, who I was able to sign finally and get the close to the draft to try and keep them occupied for three days. I mean, you, you get a hotel room and you, you fill the baths up with beer and and uh, you, you arrange for meals and all this other stuff. All the while, like the Houston team that Don Clark, when he later on became our quarterback, is a quarterback. Off the street in another hotel, and he's offering them, uh, you know, swimming privileges and, and uh, taking them for hot baths and all this other stuff, whining and dining them. But they're, 
the famous story is Otis Taylor, uh, who I talk about most, or Harry Shue, uh, Taylor, who was drafted by, or hidden by Dallas, and was drafted secretly. And each, each leg had their own draft, but then they had a babys babysitters. And the, the NFL had a, 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 you know, a really in intricate babysitting thing in each city. In fact, the mayor of, of, of uh, the governor of Massachusetts, Ed King, who played for the Colts years before that, was the chief babysitter in New England for all of the New England players. I mean, they, people have been hidden, kidnapped, and I said, the one great story of this Otis Taylor, who the Cowboys were hiding in a hotel outside of Dallas, um, Lloyd Wells, who was the African American scout for the Kansas City Chiefs, the Ch Chiefs wanted to draft him. So Lamar Hudson is playing, private plane to the airport in Dallas. Um, and they, got, they got a cab and rented a car, found out where the motel was, uh, a window of the motel, got into his room, snuck him out through a window, <laughs> into a waiting car, and he was right out of Superman. I got in the airport in Dallas, and the NFL never got a chance. I saw he knows Taylor right away. He's one of the great players, too, I think, belongs in the whole thing. But there, there, there were cases like the 1964 draft when the personnel director, my boss, had a heart attack before the draft, and I actually took over the draft. And ran it, and I think that's what showed Don Shula I could do it. But our, our, our first choice was Mike Curtis, who I liked. And I think we'll always all say, but the second one was Ralph Bealey, who, uh, who would have been a 10 year starter for us, but uh, we couldn't sign him, so we made a deal with Tech Schramm to give us a choice, and we had to let Dallas sign him because he wasn't going to come to, to Baltimore. And then my, my, my next couple of choices, Al Atkinson, who started for the Jets and played against us in the 68 Super Bowl team. And uh, Marty Schottenheimer, they signed with the Jets and the Buffalo Bills. But they were my first four choices. Wow. What was your, like, when you got that position, did you have, um, I mean, did you go into it with a certain approach that you knew you wanted to implement? Like, did you have your own methodology that you had kind of cultivated from being a scout and doing a certain, doing things a certain way? Or were you kind of like learning on the job as you were kind of going along? No, I was ready. I mean, you, you, you think about it, and I was 26, 27. But remember, because of all of my background, going back to being a child, I was around football players. I watched them. I watched their quickness, their lack of quickness. All, all this I was absorbing as a kid. Um, and so basically, um, once I became... Personnel director, I changed everything. I wanted to go to computers, which we did. I wanted to join the scouting combine. We've already been in one, but, but we were in free share. I wanted to give like we do tests, which are called the Wonderlick tests, which we uh, did. I wanted to use extensive film study. Uh, I saw the future, that quickness was just as important as speed. All these different things that, that I brought to show and said, the, these are the things that I want to do. And uh, also with, with that, I want to add more scouts, personal scouts. So one of the people that, that I hired, the Shula recommended I hired, went on and just was put in the Hall of Fame. George Young became the New York Giants general manager. I hired him right out of high school. I said, well, he had experience. He, he was one summer with the old Dallas Texans. Mm -hmm. Set for high school coaches, but he, I, I wasn't looking for some good old boy. I was looking for somebody that had intelligence and was willing to implement the things that I wanted. So my advantage was I wasn't from the old school scouting, and so I and I liked a lot of things that Gil Brandt was doing in Dallas. I actually stopped in Dallas and sat down with him. I knew Tex Fram because he was a friend of my father's, so. I was looking to implement everything that would be able to give me an advantage. Was Rosenblum pretty helpful in terms of providing you resources for doing what you wanted as well? He never got in the way. Never? Never said a word. Do you think that Rose... 
Go ahead. It's simpler than I worked with. And Rosamund was one of those people, if you're successful, you know, whatever he did, he did. If you weren't successful, you'd be walking the plank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he always seemed to me, and if you agree, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Like, it seems to me that he was kind of like the owner that bridged the gap between the old guard and the new guard in the sense where he was like the old guard where he had played football and he was a football guy, but he came into the league. Like, well, yeah, he put, he, coached by my father. yeah, yeah, you know, he, he was coached by your father. He played at Penn, but he came into the league when he had money and he kind of enjoyed the celebrity status that went along with being it that eventually came with it. So do you think he was kind of like the transition into a more modern NFL when he came in? Well, I, th I think a couple of things. I think a lot of people were jealous of him to begin with. First of all, uh, he might have been, I think he was the first Jewish owner. Oh, really? Number one. He was friendly with the Kennedys. Uh, he had all these glamorous people around him. Uh, and, and of course, the one thing that got him killed, I think, well, like got him killed, he belongs in the Hall of Fame. Remember, he turned out uh, and, and gave us the opportunity, you know how many people are either in the Hall of Fame from our organization or went on to become general managers? People talk about Dallas and Colts were the greatest organization in football. Uh, his biggest problem was uh, the unproven thing that everybody's pretty sure of is, is gambling. Oh, yeah. And, and if my father had lived, he would have had to face that uh, with because he, he and Rosenblum were friends besides him getting in in football, but, but, uh, and, and of course, his famous falling out with Shaw, which made them both in some ways, but he was very controversial as, as an owner. And of course, I, I can remember, he was so glamorous, you know, the, the coach in the off season, he would arrange for his private plane to pick up like Unitas and Gino Marchetti and, and Raymond Berry and some of the players and fly him to Hyannis to play touch football with the Kennedy. So, yeah. I mean, he was, he was big news. Uh, but the, the thing hanging over him was the suspicion that he gambled on games. And, and, uh, I think he came within a couple of votes of being thrown out of the league. And then whatever, after you left Baltimore, you became the general manager of the Patriots, which was the exact opposite of a winning franchise. That, that is, what is the crucible? That was an example of making a big mistake of youth uh, and, and looking to the future and, and not being realistic and saying that's not a good situation. And it's funny, uh, the, the other item, the, because of the loss of the Super Bowl in 68, if we have won, I probably, well, not now, but I'd probably still be there. Shula be there. George Young would still be there. Ernie, of course, who came later would still be there. And Harry Hughes. That one game, within four years, we were all gone. Either by our own volition or by, by you know, being fired, whatever it is. Rosenblum never forgave Shula for that. And it's a shame because two years later we won the Super Bowl anyway. But that, that game's so embarrassing that in the end, in 1970, after we won the Super Bowl, I thought, it's time for me to move on. Um, at, th at that time, the Patriots were interested in me. And basically, I made a deal that included hiring and firing the coach, but what was the big mistake I made? I didn't have that part in writing. And it ended up to be the thing that killed me, the controversy and everything else like that. So that, that and not only that, you, you don't go into a situation where there, there, there were like 32 owners and, and directors and they're all fighting. Yeah. But what's the good part, at least in my mind? During that period of almost two years, I was able to hire Buckle Kilroy. Mm -hmm. Tom Boyster, New York Football Giants, Mike Hickey, Dick Steinberg, 
all the people that I hired, including Peter Hattes, went on to be the directors of player personnel and general managers. And Bucko stayed on, eventually general manager. And uh, we had some of the greatest drafts I ever had. So that I wasn't around for the good days, but I was around the set that we built the whole background. Of. You also had uh, Rami Lodd too, right? Yep, I made him. So scouting, but those three guys whose life ended up tragically. Oh, really? And what? In, in the World Football League later on, that I was involved in, he, he basically took over the Florida Blazers mm -hmm. and started to make deals with drug people to oh. keep them alive. And it ended very badly for him. So before we get to that part, like, how, how did you actually get involved? Because you uh, ended up moving one franchise in the WFL down to Charlotte, and they became the Charlotte Hornets. That's how the story goes? Yeah, actually, Howard Baldwin now is a big-time Hollywood producer. I for friends for years. And he came to me, and he said, you know, the league needs a big name. And, and uh, I think you did a terrific job here, blah, blah, blah. Would you be interested? And I said, well, let me take a look at I have a lot of doubts about Gary Davidson. I have a lot of doubts about the league. <clears throat> but let me take a look. And so he had me look at two or three different franchises. And he said, I am Bob Smirks from the New York Stars. He said, uh, Smirks is having a lot of financial problems. Uh, are you interested in taking it over? And I looked at their roster and their coach. And I, ironically, some of the New York Jets that beat us in 1968 were on that roster. Jerry Feldman, John Elliott, people like that. And I, I had for years, because of all my travels, been able to go in and see what places I thought the future would be NFL franchise cities. And the one that I picked ended up being a franchise city, but just not for me, and that was Charlotte. So I called Roland back and I said, I'm willing to take it over uh, and see if we can make a deal. I said, but only if I can take it to Charlotte. And uh, he agreed. I signed the papers and uh, took it to Charlotte. And uh, I could see right away it was going to be an NFL franchise. Just like everything else. Isn't it? What if you don't have a link to play? Yeah. Did you... Uh, did you kind of join, did you join like the WFL with the hopes that maybe it could be a successful league on its own or were you trying to I was looking at both. parlay it into a merger? I, I was looking at it both as, as John Bassett born the Memphis South and son is like a kick in Warfield. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I was looking at it as both, as both whatever happened first. Um, and, and I mean, that was another fascinating aspect of my life because basically whether I realized it or not I was really repeating what Bert Bell did 50, 60 years earlier take, taking over in a lake that at that time wasn't the greatest lake and and also you know a franchise I was a good city as he had with Philadelphia uh, but the problem was with the lake maker. I, I thought I could make it. Uh, but with the, with the lake maker. But through that, I had Ted Turner mm -hmm. take over. And the famous meeting with him take over all my TV. I got John Belt, one of the most powerful people in the South at that time, about department stores. Uh, Luther Hodges of the North Carolina. I, I got all the right people to do it. And, and got Bob Gibson. After the first year, Babe Frilly was our coach. I got Bob Gibson there to what coach the team, who then went on to the NFL. Everything was going right. But what happened was the link to play in after a year. Okay. Well, like, what happened after? I mean, you came in at the middle of the 74 season, right? Yep. And then there was. Took, took him to show. Well, it, Mm -hmm. Opening game, they're playing the Memphis South, which eventually would be like a kick in Warfield the following year. Sold out the game. Arnold Palmer gives me a gold Cadillac. Palmer buys 
one of the first uh, uh, chairs in the team. And uh, we're off and running. I mean, we're, we've been selling out. <laughs> we, were, we were right in the whole thing. And then all of a sudden, uh, Smurts' problems, his bills from New York begin to follow me to Charlotte. And the next thing I know, <laughs> it was right out. I mean, it was right. It, it was, I mean, that. That session was right out of Hollywood because basically they're playing a game in Shreveport and I get a call. It's one of the few games I didn't go to from my business manager and he said, right out of the Dodge commercial, he said the sheriff's here and is going to uh, confiscate the uniforms before the game. I said, well, see if we can talk about if, you know, taking the uniforms, we need to play the game. He said, okay. He said, I'll try to do it. And then I say, as soon as the game is over, have the buses ready and see if we can get the hell out of town. <laughs> <laughs> Before the sheriff. I mean, it's a movie in itself. But what happened at the end of the game, the sheriff confiscated the uniforms. We had nothing to, to play with the following week. So we had to finally make a deal and bail them out. And uh, we were able to pretty much finish the season. But then... They, the, the first season, even though we were in the playoff spot, the late voters signed in the playoffs because they didn't have enough money to, to for only the two top teams. So that, that was a why. I, I can tell you, I, everything happened in that way, including me finally meeting Elvis Presley, uh, who was not in good shape at that point in his life. Was that towards? But, that was towards the end of his yeah. life. Uh, yeah, uh, well, John Bassett, the owner of Memphis, uh, we we played one of the early games against the Memphis South when the Sun could kick in Warfield. And uh, John said, you want to meet Elvis Presley? <laughs> I said, sure. And we had to meet him, and, and it just didn't seem like he, he, was, he wasn't with it. He, was, he had gotten very heavy. He was uh, sweating profusely. And, you know, just I felt kind of sad. Here's... here's one of the great American icons. Right. He actually got him to write a letter and say he was part of the ownership. But it was not the Elvis and you and I think of. So, yeah. again, there, a lot of crazy things happened during those two years that I can remember. Here's the irony. We're playing the Philadelphia Bell in Philadelphia at Franklin Field. I finally got my mother to go to a game. Uh, she hadn't gone to a game in years. And uh, in Philadelphia, you have to climb to the very top because no elevators in Franklin Field. Mm -hmm. And here I am back at the scene where Bert Bell dropped dead in the last two minutes of the game. And uh, we play the Philadelphia Bell. And what happens is it rains that night. Also, uh, there's a strike with the workers there. And they're surrounding the stadium. <laughs> Nobody can come in. <laughs> Play for back to Bert Bell in the 30s. He played for before hardly anybody there. You could hear, you know, the, the shoes hitting squish, squish, the artificial turf. Nobody there, everybody in the press box. And two days later, we lose a game. Two days later, the lake shuts down. Two months later, my mother's dead. No. And so I say to myself, my father died there, and my mother might as well have. You know, that's and my team did. That's back to the irony of life. Yeah, yeah, it's like the so, full circle. Now, what about now? You mentioned like how the whole WFL was like this comedy of errors, and that it could be like a movie in and of itself. Well, I think one of the funniest parts of your book is when you talk about Paul Masso. Oh no, no. Paul Sasso. Paul Sasso. Paul Sasso. Do you want to tell the yeah, listeners that story? Listen, I've had so many experiences in life I could do two movies. But that one was that one was really interesting in that there was there were stories in the paper that if we didn't raise a certain amount of money the second year, you know, that we wouldn't be able to, you know, be part of the league. So the North Carolina National Bank was trying to help if we put out a public offering, everything else like that. So I get a call one day, and it's this guy says, Hi, this is Paul Sasso from Memphis. He said, I read about your play. I'm a big developer. He said, I want to come up. I have a rendering of a, of a new stadium that I think can help you and, and invest in your team. And I 
You know, when you're desperate, you're desperate. Right. right? <laughs> so he, he flies up, private plane, comes in, we meet with him. I take him to City Hall with my lawyer and meet John Belfka Mayor. And, uh, you know, you had to get, to get anything done in Charlotte, there are two things. You better have the North Carolina National Bank on board, but you better have Mayor John Belk on board. You have him on board, you ain't going anywhere. So he meets the mayor, he shows him a rendition of his new stadium and everything else like that. And after he's back to the place, he's got two kind of strange looking henchmen with him uh, that seem to be doing a lot of talking. Mm -hmm. and, and so anyway, he said, well, I'm going back to my place that I've rented. And we'll get the papers drawn up in the next few days. And basically, he said, I'll, I'll talk to you tomorrow, whatever it was. So next day, I get a call from Larry Charlton, who was the, the editor, uh, sports editor of the Charlotte Observer. And he said, boy, I have a strange night last night. He said, I got a call at the newspaper uh, from these two guys who said, they like me to be the new owner. Now he's the new owner. Paul Sasso. He said he'd like you to come out to his house and talk and explain it. I think he writes a story if you go back and find it. And uh, he gets it in the car and it's like the like there blindfolding him and and uh, driving him out to this suspicious place or something to meet the owner. So he goes out to the place and he meets with him and he said, this guy's going on and on about all the things he's going to do for Charlotte and all this other stuff. And he said, I felt like I was being semi-kidnapped. <laughs> and I think he writes a story about it the next day. Then, like a day later, I get a, I see a, t a TV story. Bill Ballinger wrote for the Charlotte News, which is also owned by the Observer. Gets us a Sasson calls him and said, Want to take a trip with me? I'm going to try to go to Toronto and visit the John Bassett. So he gets on this private plane with, uh, with Sasson and the two henchmen. And he notices there's guns on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> so they're flying uh, to. Toronto and uh, Bassett don't want to see him. He's on the phone with Bassett. Yeah, I'm here with Bill Ballinger on the, on the uh, Charlotte News, and I'm going to do all these things for Bell and for Charlotte and everything else. I got Bassett saying, oh, well, that's great, whatever else it is. <laughs> so again, on the way back, he sees these guns on the plane. Anyway, when they land, the, you know, the FBI or the authorities are at the airport. And, and they make an arrest of this guy. And as it turns down, to make a long story short, is that his name is really Paul Sasson. He's in the witness protection program <laughs> in, in Memphis. He steals a plane. Don't you love it? It's amazing. Why am I not in this movie? He steals a plane, brings it to Charlotte, does this whole routine. And as it turns out, he was in the witness protection program because basically uh, he had uh, supposedly worn a wire and, uh, and the mafia in New York had threatened to kill him. So he tried to commit suicide off the very Toronto Bridge. I know there's video somewhere. And, and uh, what's his name? Talks him off the bridge. He's now with, uh, he's now with Fox. I, I, I'll remember it. Like, he's an anchor or like uh No, he's he's now a oh my god. <laughs> I'll think of it. But but he he's working for Fox at the time and he does a lot of different things. He's he's uh no, he was working for ABC, I think, or NBC at the time, and uh now does commentary for Fox. He's been he I wanna say Julio uh, been, Oh uh Geraldo. Geraldo Geraldo Rivera, yeah. Well, I was talking about <laughs> and, and his real name is Paul Sasson. Now, the guy who wrote the book with me, Ron Borges, <laughs> did more investigation 
And finally, uh, I guess about five years or more ago, they found him in the trunk of a car and can't tell whether he was either murdered by gangsters or whether he took his own life. I mean, how, would, how if you killed yourself, how would you put yourself in the trunk of a car? Well, you'd have somebody do it. Yeah. They, they never believed his story totally. That the, that they, they're not really sure about this guy. <laughs> I believe in the mystery. Now, what's the happy ending to this, at least for the time being? Everybody's so shocked and everything by this. The North Carolina National Bank calls me and says, we'll put up the money uh, until you can raise the rest. So you will be able to go to the link meeting in New York and say that Charlotte is in. So all the bad things that happened to me is actually, uh, uh, that's why I love Charlotte. The talent Charlotte, North Carolina Bank actually saved the franchise. Dude, this guy. <laughs> That's incredible. That's like, uh, what, what's the movie? Analyze this. Yeah, yeah. That's incredible. What was it? What was it? So, what was his plan? He was just gonna kind of cross the uh, the feds and try to steal money and go on the lam. Nobody knows. <laughs> they, they just think he's nuts. <laughs> he probably is. I mean, that, that's so. Then, then he from his, his cell in Memphis, he called. His one or two calls, he called, I think, the Charlotte News and said he would give them the exclusive if they, he would pay a certain amount of money. <laughs> they turned it down. At least, I don't know, at least he has a good sense of humor, I guess. <laughs> well, I, 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 I think there was something that turned out wrong with him. But it's, again, another great lesson in when you're desperate, you'll believe anything. Look at all the scams today. Yeah. I, Mine was a scam on a on a gigantic scale. Good for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hey, it gives you it gives you a good story to tell at the very least, right? Well, uh, again, you 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 have uh, to me you have to accept disappointment. Yeah, with a sense of humor somehow. Yeah, definitely. So, like now, after the WFL ended, did you uh, you try to get back in the NFL, but you, there was no no go there. Well, no, what, what really happened is basically when, and unlike today, if you have the fight with longer today and you're really good, nobody cares. There's 32 teams. Uh -huh. But when I had the fight with Bill Sullivan, the owner, he actually, he actually blackballed me. Yeah. He was a bit. Uh, but I finally, I went to Wellington Mara after I had been down because I knew that Wellington was interested as me as being one of the possible people he would consider when Andy Robustelli retired. In fact, Bob Gibson, who was on that staff till they all got fired <clears throat> with, the phone, with, the, with the bad handoff to Larry Zonka, which cost them the game against the Eagles. <clears throat> and I said to him, I really believe that I'm being blacklisted. And I said, uh, I mean, I've even called Pete about it. And Wellington, really terrific guy, said to me, Let, he said, don't say anything, I will get back to you. And about a month later, he got back to me, and basically, and I wish I could find the letter, but although I'm not sure I'd make it public, but he, he said to me, it wasn't Bill Sullivan, it was his son Chuck, uh. telling the owners he's a bad guy, he's a no new killer, and all that other stuff. As a result, I never got back. And started again. Here is here we are to life. Got to pick up the pieces. End up having a forty-year career in radio and television that eclipses anything I was going to do in the NFL. I think. Did you? I mean, did you? Did you have a lot of like a, a big working relationship with Chuck when you were at the uh, Patriots, or do you think he was just trying to cover for his father's ineptitude? Well, I never had a working relationship. Nobody ever had a working relationship. With him, he wasn't around very much. He was, he was like, Daddy made sure he was the club attorney, uh -huh. and then he later became for a while head of the management council. No, I had no relationship other than you knew uh, if his father, because the owners eventually, because of the controversy with me, threw Sullivan out. Now he brought his way back in again, but, but Sullivan said, you know, understood because of what he did with me. Yeah, that the others would see the internal fight and finally have enough of 
all of his shenanigans. They threw him out. They, they, they replaced him as president of the board. And he probably, in his mind, never forgave me. <clears throat> but he, he didn't have to if he had just agreed that, that I had at least the right to get rid of a coach that never made it. And you actually interviewed him in uh, on television a few years later, didn't you? On radio, yeah. How was that? Which, which, which proved to me that if you're going to be in the radio and television business, you better be able to interview even your greatest enemy, or you're not going to make it. So it was, it was it's hard to swallow, but I did it. And it was actually a good interview. And he, of course, like most funny people, he acted like nothing happened. <laughs> was that like, uh, I mean, do, do you think that was, how many years into your like radio career were you when you did that interview? First year. Oh, first year. Okay. So yeah, that's, that's something I think most people would probably hold off trying to attempt, I think a few years, but yeah, you just were thrown right in the fire. You gotta have coverage. Yeah. You gotta be doing more things, but from that thing and the lessons I learned, I ended up in 1990 at the White House interviewing the President of the United States. H.W.? H.W. Was that the highlight of your career? Uh, one of them. One of them? Uh, uh, so, I mean, certainly that at, that at that time, because they were getting ready for Desert Storm, and I approached him on the idea. I knew his sister. And again, that's luck in life. I, I, I saw his sister on a, a tea here in Boston one day, and uh, approached him to her, would he be interested in how a, a president deals with the, with the pressures of life to his love of sports? And she bought it, went right to the White House. And a week later, I got a call from the Secret Service and from the White House, be here and be here next week. And I did. And he was great. We went 30 minutes. And that's still, that's out there, parts of it on YouTube. But I, I, there, there were other ones, a radio one that I probably won't forget is uh, somehow I got lucky and got Stephen Hawking to mm. talk about black holes in the universe. I mean, I was able, I was able to do a talk to particularly in my radio career because I decided another thing in my life that I needed to change. What I did is I left sports and went full-time on straight talk and uh, started to interview people from all over the world. And as a result, this collection will be coming out the fall of 500 of the greatest authors I've ever interviewed. And, and uh, I actually ended up, they liked it so much that when Stephen Hawking came to Boston, I had a private audience with him. Wow. But your collection, is this going to be in the form of a book or is this like a... Uh... Well, I have two collections. The sports collection, you know, is already out there. Uh -huh. The book collection will take a look. You'll eventually be able to see 500 authors from around the world, over 30 Pulitzer Prize winners, five Nobel Prize winners, and their books what they wrote to me in their books, their inscriptions, their history, their background, any interviews like the other day. Uh, I don't know whether you heard of them, but Theo Epstein's father, Leslie, is a great, great writer. And Leslie's father and uncle wrote the greatest script of any movie, uh, Casablanca. Mm. And uh, Leslie does a, a book on his, on his father's Life and and uh, also his uncle and how they came to the ending of Casablanca. <clears throat> well, I got a friend of mine who's a great interviewer. Just finished doing the interview because during the pandemic you can't go any, can't go into some other place. So I attached the interview to it, and and uh, I'm, I'm hopefully going to find the interview of the Dalai Lama. I mean, every what will not only be is the authors. Their history, what they wrote to me, like some of the full pages on what, why they write, wrote this book and stuff. But also, eventually, will be in there another history of the Bell family in pictures, in audios, in, in videos, in all, in all sorts of forms, including I, I went not long after the assassination in 1963, I got pictures of the Texas Book Depository and actually where the guy, where, where he actually shot 
the thing from the room. And wow. so the, 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 the woman in red who I interviewed who was on the grassy knoll. Wow. The picture, she signed the picture to me and we, we talked. We're looking for the interview of, of that. So it, it's a multimedia. It might be one of the biggest collections in the country. Yeah, I look forward to I look forward to seeing that when it comes out. So, do you have, uh, I guess, any last like um, closing words of wisdom for? I mean, obviously, as the uh, the life you've lived, you've had a lot of experience and you've learned a lot. Do you have any advice for any of the uh, young listeners who are tuning in for the show? I would say to all all of young, old, middle aged people that that basically. My mantra is somewhere along the line when you're lying on your deathbed, nobody's going to ask you how famous you are. Nobody's going to ask you how much money you made or where you went. But you are going to ask yourself, did I do what I wanted to do? Not for money, not for fame. Did I do what I wanted to do? And I will tell you in my case, <laughs> with failure, success, and even, you know, great failure, I always did what I wanted to do. 